the weekly test. At two o'clock sharp, the class assembled, including Miss Honey, who noted that the jug of water and the glass were in the proper place. Then she took up a position standing right at the back. Everyone waited. Suddenly in marched the gigantic figure of the headmistress in her belted smock and green breeches. Good afternoon, children, she barked. Good afternoon, Miss Trunchable, they chirped. The headmistress stood before the class, um, legs apart, hands on hips, glaring at the small boys and girls who sat nervously at their desk in the front of her. Not a very pretty sight, she said. Her expression was none of utter distaste, as though she were looking at something a dog had done in the middle of the floor. What a bunch of nauseating little warts you are. Everyone had their sense to stay silent. It makes me vomit, she went on, to think that I'm going to have to put up with the loads of garbage like you in my school for the next six years. I can see that I'm going to have to expel as many of you as possible, as soon as possible, to save myself from going around the bend. She paused and snorted several times. It was a curious noise. You can hear the same sort of thing if you walk through a riding stable when the horse, uh, horses are being fed. I suppose, she went on, your mothers and fathers tell you you're wonderful. Well, I am here to tell you the opposite, and you better believe me. Stand up, everybody. They all quickly got up to their feet. Now put your hands out in front of you, and as I walk past, I want you to turn them over so I can see if they're clean on both sides. The trencher began um, to slowly march along the rows of the desks, inspecting all the hands. All well, until she came across a small boy in the second row. What's your name, she barked. Nigel, the boy said. Nigel what? Nigel Hicks, the boy said. Nigel Hicks what? The turntable bell bellowed, and she bellowed so loud she nearly blew the little chap out of the window. That's it, Nigel said, unless you want my middle name as well. He was brave, a little fellow, and one could see that he was trying not to be scared by the, um, by the Gorgons who was towering above him. I don't want your middle name, you blister. The, uh, the Gorgon bellowed, what is my name? It's Trunchable, Nigel said. Then use it when you address me. Now then. Let's try this again. What's your name? Nigel Hicks, Miss Trunchbull, Nigel said. That's better, the Trunchbull said. Your hands are filthy, Nigel. When did you last wash them? Well, let me think, Nigel said. That's rather difficult to remember exactly. It could have been yesterday or it could have been the day before. The Trunchbull's whole body and face seemed to swell up as though she was big, inflated by a being inflated by a bicycle butt pump. I knew it, she bellowed. I knew as, I, as soon as I saw you that you were nothing but a piece of filth. What is your father's job? A sewage worker? He's a doctor, Nigel said, and a jolly good one. He says we're all so covered with bugs anyways that a bit of extra dirt never hurts anyone. I'm glad he's not my doctor, the Trunchbull said. And why might I ask, is there baked beans on the front of your shirt? We had them for lunch, Miss Trunchbull. And do you usually put your lunch on the front of your shirt, Nigel? Is that what your famous uh, doctor father of yours has taught you? Baked beans are hard to eat, Miss Trunchbull. They kept falling off my fork. You are disgusting, the Trunchbull bellowed. You are walking a walking germ factory. I don't wish to see any more of you today. Go and stand in the corner on one leg with your face to the wall. But Miss Trunchbull, don't argue with me, boy, or I'll make you stand on your head. Now do as you're told. Nigel went. Now, stay where you are, boy, while I test on you, um, on you your spelling to see if you've learned anything at all this past week. And don't turn around when I talk to you. Keep your nasty little face into the wall. Now then spell right. Which one, Nigel asked. The thing you do with your pen or the one that means the opposite of wrong. He happened to be an unusually bright child and his mother had worked hard with him at home on spelling and reading. The one with the pen, you little fool. Nigel spelled it correctly, which surprised the Trunchable. She thought she had given him a very tricky word, one that he wouldn't have learned yet, and she was peeved that he had succeeded. Then Nigel said, uh, said, still balancing on one leg and facing the wall, Miss Honey taught us how to spell a new, very long word yesterday. And what's that word? The Trunchbull asked, softly. The softer her voice became, the greater the danger. But Nigel wasn't to know this. Difficulty, Nigel said. Everyone in the class can spell difficulty now. What nonsense, the Trunchbull said. You're not supposed to learn long words like that until you are at least eight or nine. And don't try to tell me everybody in the class can spell that word. You are lying to me, Nigel. Test someone, Nigel said, taking an awful chance. Test anyone you like. The Trunchable's dangerous, glittering eyes um, ro rolled around the room. You, she said, pointing to a tiny and rather daft little girl called Prudence. Spell difficulty. Amazingly, Prudence spelled it correctly without a moment of hesitation. The Trunchable was properly taken aback. <laughs> she snorted. 
And I suppose Miss Honey wasted the whole of one lesson teaching you to spell one single word. Oh no, she didn't, piped Nigel. Miss Honey taught us th um, in three minutes, so we'll never forget it. She teaches us lots of words in three minutes. And what exactly is this magic method, Miss Honey? Asked the headmistress. I'll show you, piped up the brave Nigel again, coming to Miss Honey's rescue. I, can I put my foot down and turn around, please, while I show you? You do, may do neither, snapped the trench wolf. Stay as you are and show me the just the same. All right, said Nigel, wobbling crazily on his one leg. Miss Honey gives us a song about each word, and we'll sit, we all sing it together, and we learn how to spell it in no time. Would you like to hear the song about difficulty? I should be fascinated, the trench wolf said, in a voice dripping with sarcasm. Here it is, Nigel said. Mrs. D, Mrs. I, Mrs. F. F-I, Mrs. C, Mrs. U, Mrs. L-T-Y. That spells difficulty. How perfectly ridiculous. Sorry, Miss Trunchbull. Why are all these women married? And anyways, you're not meant to teach poetry when you're teaching spelling. Cut, out, cut it out from the future, Miss Honey. But it does teach them some, um, some of the hardest words wonderfully well, Miss Honey murmured. Don't argue with me, Miss Honey, the headmistress thundered. Just do as you're told. I shall now test the class in multiplication tables to see if Miss Honey has talked to you anything at all in this direction. The trunchbull had returned to her place in front of the classroom and her diabolical gaze was moving slowly along the rows of tiny peoples. You, she barked, pointing to a small boy called Rupert in the front row. What is two times seven? Sixteen, Rupert answered with a foolish, <laughs> foolish look. The trunchbull st started advancing slowly and softly um, upon Rupert in a manner of a tiger stalking, stalking a small deer. Rupert suddenly became aware of the dangerous signals and quickly tried again. It's 18, he cried. Two sevens is our 18, no, 16. You ignorant little slug, the trunchbull bellowed. You witless weed, you empty-headed hamster. You silly glob of glue. She had now stationed herself directly behind Rupert and suddenly extended a hand the size of a tennis racket and grabbed all the hair on Rupert's head in a fist. Rupert had a lot of golden colored hair. His mother thought it was beautiful to behold and took delight in allowing it to grow extra long. The Trunchable had a, as great dislike for long hair on boys as she had for plaits and pigtails on girls, and she was about to show it. She took firm grip on Rupert's long golden tresses with his, her giant hand, and then by raising her muscular right arm, she lifted the helpless boy clean out of the, uh, his chair and held him aloft. Rupert yelled, he twisted, he screamed, he kicked in the air and went on yelling like a stuffed pig. Miss Trunchbull bellowed, two sevens are 14. Two sevens are 14. I'm not letting you go until you say it. From the back of the class, Miss Honey cried out, Miss Trunchbull, please let him down, you're hurting him. All his hair might come out. And well, it might if he doesn't keep, uh, doesn't stop from wiggling, started uh, the Trunchbull. Keep still, you squirming worm. It really was quite an ordinary, extraordinary sight to see this giant headmistress dangling the small boy high up in the air and the boy spinning and twisting like something on the end of a string and shrieking his head off. Say it, bellowed the trunchbull. Say two sevens are fourteen. Hurry up or I'll start jerking you up and down and from then your hair will really come out and we'll have enough of it to stuff a sofa. Get on with it, boy. Two sevens are fourteen and I'll let you go. Two, uh... Sevens are, are four, 14, gasped Rupert, whereupon the trunchbull, true to her word, opened up her hand and quite literally let him go. He was a long way off the ground when she released him, and he plummeted to the earth and hit the floor and bounced like a football. Get up and stop whimpering, the trunchbull barked. Rupert got up and went back to his desk, massaging his scalp with both hands. The trunchbull returned to the front of the class. The children sat there hypnotized. None of them had seen anything quite like this before. It was splendid entertaining. It was better than a pantomime, but with one big difference. In this room, there was an enormous human bomb in front of them, which was liable to explode and blow someone into bits at any moment. The children's eyes riveted on the headmistress. I don't like small people, was um, what she was saying. Small people should never be seen by anybody. They should be kept out of sight in boxes like hairpins and buttons. I can't for the life of me, see why children have to take so long to grow up. I think they do it on purpose. Another extremely brave little boy in the front row spoke up and said, but surely you were a small person once, Miss Trunchbull, weren't you? I was never a small person, she snapped. I've been large all my life, and I don't see why others can't be the same way. 
but you must have started as a baby, the boy said. Me? A baby? shouted the trunchable. How dare you suggest such a thing? What cheek? What inferal insolence? What's your name, boy, and stand up when I speak to you? The boy stood up. My name is Eric Ink, Miss Trunchbull. Um, he said, Eric, what? The Trunchbull shouted. Ink, the boy said. Don't be silly, bo a silly boy. There's no such name. Look in the phone book, Eric said. You'll see my father there under Ink. Very well then, the Trunchbull said. You may be Ink, young man, but let me tell you something. You're not, um, you're not in a, inedible. I will have you, uh, I'll very soon rub you up if you try um, getting clever with me. Spell what? I don't understand, Eric said. What do you want me to spell? Spell what, you silly person. Spell the word what? W-O-T? Eric said, answering too quickly. There was a nasty silence. I'll give you one more chance, the Trunchbull said, not moving. Ah, yes, I know, Eric said. It's got an H in it. W H O T. It's easy. In two large strides, the Trunchable was behind Eric's desk, and there she stood, a pillar of doom, towering over the helpless boy. Eric glanced fearfully back over his shoulder at the monster. I was right, wasn't I? He murmured nervously. You were wrong, the Trunchable barked. In fact, you strike me as the sort of poisonous little po uh, pockmark that will always be wrong. You sit wrong, you look wrong, you speak wrong, you are wrong all around. I will give you one more chance to be right. Spell what? Eric hesitated and then he said, it's not W-O-T and it's not W-H-O-T. Ah, I know, it must be W-H-O-T-T. -T. Standing behind Eric, the Trunchbull reached out and took hold of the boy by the two ears with each hand pinching them between her forefingers and thumb. Ow, Eric cried, ow, you're hurting me. I haven't started yet, the Trunchbull said briskly. And now taking a firm grip of his two ears, she lifted him, bod um, him bodily out of his seat and held him aloft. Like Rupert before him, Eric squealed the house down. From the back of the classroom, Miss Honey cried out, Miss Trunchbull, don't, please don't, please let him go. His ears might come off. They'll never come off, the Trunchbull shouted back. I have discovered through a long experience, Miss Honey, that the ears of small boys are stuck firmly to their heads. Let go of him, Miss Trunchbull, please, begged Miss Honey. You could damage him and re you really could. You could wrench, um, wrench them right off. Ears never come off, the Trunchbull shouted. They stretch most marvelously like though you, these are doing now. Uh, but I can assure you, they never come off. Eric was squealing louder than ever. And, um, Paddling, or peddling the air with his legs. Matilda had never seen a boy, or anyone else for that matter, held aloft by his ears alone. Like Miss Honey, she felt sure both ears were going to come off at any moment with the weight um, that was on them. The Trunchable was showing the word what is spelled W-H-A-T. Now spell it, you little wart. Eric didn't hesitate. He had learned from watching Rupert a few minutes before that the quicker you answered, the quicker you were released. W-H-A-T, he squealed, spell what? Still holding him by the ear, so Trunchable um, lowered him back into his chair behind his desk. Then she marched back to the front of the class, dusting off her hands once again, like another, um, uh, against the other, like someone who had been handling something rather grimy. That's the way you make them learn, Miss Honey, she said. You take it from me. It's no good just telling them. You've got to hammer it into them. There's nothing like that, a little twisting and twiddling to encourage them to remember things. It concentrates their mind wonderfully. You could do them permanent damage, Miss Trunchable. Miss Honey cried out, oh, I have, and I'm quite sure I have, the Trunchable answered, grinning. Eric's ears will have stretched quite considerably in the last couple of minutes. They'll be much longer than uh, they were before. There's nothing wrong with that, Miss Honey. It'll give him an interesting pixie look for the rest of his life. But Miss Trunchable, oh, do be quiet, Miss Honey. You're as wet as any of them. If you can't cope in here, then go and find a job in some cotton wool private school for rich brats. When you have been teaching for as long as I have, you will realize that it's no good at all to be um, all being kind to children. Read Nicholas Nickleby, Miss Honey, by, the, um, by Mr. Dickens. Read about Mr. Wackford's um, squares and the admirable headmaster of Dothboy's Hall. He knew how to handle the little brutes, didn't he? He knew how to use birch, didn't he? 
He kept it their backside so warm you could have fried an egg and bacon on them. A fine book that. But I don't suppose this bunch of um, this bunch of uh, kids would have got um, here. Will have ever read it because uh, by the looks of them, they are never going to learn to read anything. I've read it. Matilda said quietly. The chunchable flicked her head around and looked carefully at the small girl with dark hair and deep brown eyes sitting in the second row. What did you say? She said. She asked sharply. I said I've read it, Miss Trunchbull. Read what? Nicholas Nickleby, Miss Trunchbull. You are lying to me, madame, the Trunchbull shouted, glaring at Matilda. I doubt there's a single child in the entire school who has read a book, and here you are, unhatched shrimp, sitting in the lowest form there, is trying to tell me a whopping great lie like that. Why do you do it? You must take me a fool. Do you take me for a fool, child? Well, Matilda said, she hesitated, and she, um, she would have liked to say, yes, I jolly well do, but would have been suicide. Well, she said again, Still hesitating and refusing to say no, the trenchable sense that the child was thinking, and she didn't like that. Stand up when you speak to me, she snapped. What's your name? Matilda stood up and said, my name is Matilda Wormwood, Miss Trunchbull. Wormwood is it, the Trunchbull said. In that case, you must be the daughter of the man who owns Wormwood Motors. Yes, Miss Trunchbull. He's a crook, the Trunchbull shouted. A week ago, he sold me a second-hand car that said it was almost new. I thought he was a splendid fellow then. But this morning, while I was driving the car through the village, the entire engine fell out of the road, on the road. The whole thing was filled with sawdust. The man's a thief and a robber. I'll have his sk a skin for sausage if you see, I, if I don't. He's clever at his business, Matilda said. Clever my foot, the trunchbull said. Miss Honey, tell me that you are not meant, to, you are meant to be clever too. Well, madame, I don't like clever people. They're all crooked. You are the most certainly crooked. Before I fell out with your father, he told me some very nasty stories about the way you behaved at home. You, but you better not try anything in this school, young lady. I shall be keeping a very careful eye on you from now on. Sit down and keep quiet.